So today's video is going to be a little bit different than some of the other videos on my channel. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to go speak in front of a bunch of people live and give them a presentation on how to manage back pain. After doing it, I was left with the recording and I thought, hey, this would actually make a really good video for YouTube. However, there wasn't necessarily video of myself. There was only the audio and the slideshow. So I tossed the idea over to my editor, Cole, and said, hey, can we attach some B-roll to this and make it look a little nicer and present the information? Because I figured that the information is really useful and that you, my audience, could get some real valuable benefit from watching that presentation. So here's my presentation, guys. Enjoy. Feel free to give me feedback in the comments if any of these strategies have helped you manage your back pain better. And before we start, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, get started. My name is Max. I am a owner at Arctic Strength Powerlifting Club here in town, as well as I've been a personal trainer for the past decade. I've worked with a lot of people with back pain. Funnily enough, 90% of them have been accountants, so I feel like I'm in the right place. Mostly joking, but it is very common to see back pain come up in individuals that sit for long periods of time. Early in my career, when I was on the floor with clients for 9, 10, 12 hours a day, and I was moving a lot, I didn't have a lot of back pain. But in the last several years since COVID, I've transitioned into more online coaching and found even just sitting more myself. I've experienced a lot more back pain. So it's one of those things where it's going to be very multifactorial. What I want you guys to take away from it today is that there's not really a singular reason why back pain might be occurring. It could be several different things or a multitude of them. So I've came up with some common reasons why back pain might occur. And I'm going to go through some solutions and some takeaways that you guys can take away from the presentation and apply it to your own life to help manage your back pain, reduce it down. So before I get started, show of hands, who in here has back pain? Very big or everybody. <laughs> <laughs> basically everybody's gonna ask who has had back pain, but if everybody's having back pain, that answer is not for me. So today we're gonna cover the reasons for back pain being a past injury, muscles being sore or overworked, the back muscles being weak, lacking movement in the back, or just in the body, and different lifestyle factors. Starting with injury, if you're having back pain and earlier in life, maybe you were playing a sport, maybe you were lifting some weights, or maybe you were like lifting your kid or a heavy box or something like that, and you felt some pain in your back and you feel like you injured your back, maybe you went into a doctor, maybe you got it diagnosed, maybe you didn't get diagnosed, I would say that the number one thing you can do to help with back pain if it's injury related is to consult with a physiotherapist. They are the experts in pain. That's not me as a personal trainer. That's obviously people that have done a lot more schooling and stuff like that. And they're going to be able to diagnose the cause of that injury and what actionable steps you need to do move forward, manage that back pain. Now, I think a lot of people's gut instinct is to go directly to a doctor if they've had an injury or have an injury or an injury occurs. Sometimes this can be productive, but a lot of times they'll just kind of tell you to not do anything. They might prescribe some painkillers. Sometimes they might recommend some imaging. However, if you go to a physiotherapist first and you do need some imaging or you do need a surgery of some kind, they're going to be able to diagnose that and they're going to be able to refer you to the right doctor to make sure that that gets done, opposed to just going to your family doctor. So I would always say that the first step is to go directly to a physiotherapist. And if the injury does not warrant needing some type of surgery, needing some type of like imaging or anything like that, they're going to move directly to the action steps of helping you find exercises to strengthen the muscles for that injury and help work around it. A lot of physiotherapists will also do some manual therapy. You'll see like massage, dry needling, cupping, those kinds of things. All those things can be great, but I do highly recommend going to a physiotherapist that not only does those things, but also attacks some of the weakness side of things as well. I personally recommend the Bridge YYC. Nico, Matt, and the team there are really great, and they kind of attack injuries from 
all angles of things. That's who I go to. I mentioned to a few people before I started presenting that Nico helped me out with this presentation a little bit beforehand and just covering his basis and stuff. Thank you to him and that's kind of in the injury side of things, but not all back pain is injury related it can be related to other things as well one of those other things could be the muscles being sore or overworked this is more of an issue for people that are exercising frequently and exercising too much usually so i think it's one of those common things where it's like hey i want to go hard to the gym whether the goal is losing weight or improving your back pain gain muscle whatever the goal is i think a lot of people think more is better in the case of experiencing pain in the gym it's usually volume related it's usually the amount of work you're doing in the gym related and one of the best things you can do if you're experiencing back pain from your workouts is to reduce down the amount of weekly work you're doing for the back muscles. Working with a good coach can help you manage this as well. So if you're unfamiliar of like how much work should I be doing of certain exercises, finding a coach can help with this. Now, more common in sedentary individuals that aren't working out, a cause of pain in the back can be weakness of the back muscles. I think a lot of pain is actually caused by this. I think a lot of back pain can be solved by actually strengthening the muscles of the back. I think a lot of people will attribute back pain to being um, inflexible or tight in the muscles. And while that can be true, a lot of that tightness can come from the muscles not being strong enough to handle the workload they are requiring of muscles. In the case of sitting long periods of time and trying to sit up straight for long periods of time for the day, that is very physically taxing on the muscles of your back. And in order to be able to physically do that, you need your muscles to be prepared and you need them to be strong enough. So you can strengthen them by doing specific muscles to help build them up for the upper and lower back. I've listed a couple here and a few movement patterns that I think would help. So the first movement pattern I recommend is the hinging pattern. So doing some type of deadlift, trap bar deadlift, or dumbbell RDL. Now I realize that not everybody is going to be the type of person that wants to go to the gym or wants to have a gym membership. And that's totally okay. Um, through these exercises, I'm going to recommend some home recommendations as well. So the dumbbell RDL here on my right is an exercise that you can do at home um, either by purchasing dumbbell or just by finding heavy objects you have around your house, like a backpack, like a milk jug, whatever, and doing a hinge with it in order to maintain that brace, work the glutes, work the hamstrings, and work the muscles of the lower back. When it comes to back pain, not only the lower back is important, but strengthening muscles of the upper back is also important. So some exercises that I recommend for strengthening the upper back include a barbell row, a landmine row, or a cable or a band row. So with the cable or the band row, this one can be done at home by purchasing a set of bands. And if you're not the type of person that likes to go to a gym, if you're the type of person that wants to work out at home, I think one of the best purchases you can make is you can go on Amazon and for like $20, $25, you can buy a set of bands. It comes with a door mount. It comes with handles and it has bands up from 10 to 50 pounds. They all have little carabiner clips that'll attach onto the handles. You close the door mount in the door and that will allow you to do a band row as well as a lot of different exercises as well. If you're trying to put together a more complete program, I have a lot of clients that work out at home and I always recommend that they purchase a set of bands so that they can have complete workouts at home and work a lot of those point movements that you don't really get a chance to do if you don't have access to cables at home, you can kind of create your own bands. Another exercise you can do with the bands is a parallel press. And the parallel press is one of the exercises I recommend for the bracing pattern. I think having a very strong core can also help with back pain. And part of that is understanding and working your core by bracing it, having different forces trying to get you out of that neutral state. One being a Pavlov press where the band is trying to rotate you, your core is keeping you from rotating. Another example would be a plank where gravity is trying to pull you down. You have to keep your core tight to keep yourself from being pulled down. A bird dog and a side plank would also be included in that. The final movement pattern I recommend is the flexion movement pattern. I think back in the day, they would always say, hey, 
lift with a straight back. Make sure your back is as straight as possible when you're lifting. I think this holds true when you're lifting like really heavy loads. Like I wouldn't do a one rep max deadlift with the same weight I would do one of these exercises with. But I think it's as science has progressed, we've seen more and more that strengthening all movement patterns is good for the body and specifically good for the back. So in the case of flexion, learning to round your spine and then straighten your spine back out under loads, light loads, light loads that your spinal flexion can handle can be really useful for improving the strength of your back and reducing back pain. So some examples I'll give would be a barbell or a dumbbell Jefferson deadlift. Again, if you don't have dumbbells at home, you could do this with either a band or you could do it with a milk jug, backpack, anything kind of heavy, but not too heavy that you can find. That brings us to what I would say is probably the most common reason that people that have an office job that are sitting all day are experiencing back pain from is lack of movement. So when I had my meeting with Nico, my physiotherapist last night, he gave me a really good analogy that I want to share with all of you guys. And this kind of goes into posture because I think when it comes to lack of movement, I think a very common reason people are given to help back pain when sitting is to sit with impeccable posture all day long. But if you were to think about it this way, if you took your fist and you squeezed it as hard as possible for eight hours straight, and then at the end of the eight hours, I, I said, release it, your forearm would probably be really sore and your forearm would really hurt. Your hand would really hurt. You'd be really tired out. Like, it'd be hard to squeeze your like hand as hard as you could all day. Why would you expect the same thing of the muscles of your lower back? If you're sitting up super, super straight all day long, you're doing the same thing with the muscles of your back. And... Even the people with the strongest backs don't have the muscular endurance to be able to maintain that. So that's where movement hygiene kind of comes in. If you're sitting all day, try not to sit in the same posture all day. Don't be afraid to move around, adjust your posture as the day goes, and just kind of change it up a little bit. But on top of that too, I think that especially when it comes to the hip muscles, when you're in a seated position, that hip is in the same position all day. You're asking the same thing of it. If you're gonna be sitting for all eight hours of the day, I would suggest working in some cardio into your daily life so that you're getting some movement outside of work. This cardio could include walking, walking backwards, some light running, some rowing. You can also include some biking, although that's a little bit more just sitting. So it may be straight away from that because the whole goal of it would be to move the hips when you get the opportunity to. Some other options to help with this would include getting a standing sitting desk. I think this has become more and more common in the office space to have the desks where you can like change from standing to sitting. So you can alternate, maybe work half the day standing, half the day sitting. So you're not just sitting for the entire eight hours. A step goal can also be really helpful with this. If you have a step goal of 8,000 steps, 10,000 steps, 12,000 steps, even 6,000 steps, it really depends on how many steps you've been getting typically in a day. If you have a step goal that's more than you would typically get in an average day and that encourages you to move more, that means that your hips are going to be getting more movement than what they were getting prior to. So step goal can be super helpful. Something that I really like and I found really helpful, like I mentioned, when I transitioned from being on the gym floor to online coaching, I ended up sitting a lot for the day and I had to come up with like different strategies to help because I've started to get back pain myself. And that's like very uncomfortable when you've like not experienced it for like almost the entirety of your life and then you start getting it. Something that really helped me is I got this Fitbit and I got it to actually like track my sleep. But something that was unexpected is it has this function where at the 50 minute mark of every hour, it'll like buzz at me if I haven't done 250 steps already. And whenever I get that buzz, if I'm like sitting there working on like a client's program or in a session, I'll just get up and I'll just walk for two minutes because it takes about that long to get the 250 steps. And then I'll sit back down and that helps break up the sitting, which is really good for 
at least for me, has really helped me kind of maintain a position of not having a whole lot of back pain in a day. I'm pretty sure that like Apple watches and stuff like that have like similar functions where they have you like stand up and sit back down a couple times every hour. But just that like getting up and not letting the sitting string together for eight hours straight can be super helpful for this. The other thing I would recommend would be stretching for eight to 15 minutes per night, especially when it comes to the hip flexors and the muscles of the lower back and the muscles of the abdomen. They're stuck in the same position all day and they're starting to tighten up and tighten up and tighten up. And by doing some stretches before bed, it can help loosen them up a little bit and help reduce some of that pain that comes from having those tight muscles. Some stretches that I recommend and find really helpful for helping manage back pain is the night stretch, the cat cow side side stretch, which is a variation of the traditional cat cow stretch where you push your hips through the side of your pocket while in that cat cow position. That also really helps uh, stretch up the hips as well as the lower back and the abdomen. And then the cobra stretch, especially for people that find themselves sitting in the hunched over position all day, working that opposite position and opening up that abdomen can be really helpful for reducing down the amount of back pain you maybe have. Finally, when it comes to back pain, something that can be really helpful is adjusting aspects of your lifestyle. Certain aspects of your lifestyle can lead to making back pain worse. By improving your sleep, better managing your stress, and having a healthy body composition, you can help reduce back pain as well. So if you're not sleeping enough, sleeping more can help. If you're not managing stress well, managing stress better, whether that's going to therapy or whether that's doing activities that help you de-stress, can help manage back pain. If you don't have a healthy body composition, if your body's carrying a little bit more fat than it should be, the healthy ranges for men being 10 to 20%, the healthy ranges for women being 15 to 25%, getting into those ranges can help reduce down back pain as well. Obviously, sometimes it's not just that simple. A lot of times if you go and say you have back pain to the doctor, they'll be like, well, just lose weight if you're overweight. And it could be the variety of factors but that is one factor that can help play into the back pain. So helpful places to start when it comes to lifestyle factors that I give people is work on eating more protein and more vegetables, tracking your calories or working with a nutrition coach, tracking your sleep, trying to sleep seven to nine hours per night, and doing fun activities that will help you to decompress. So that concludes my presentation, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll open up the floor if anybody has any questions about back pain or just anything fitness-related that they want to fire by. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Do you think that would, uh, that would be one where you kind of bend over with a, with a straight back? Is that kind of then using some resistance to come back up? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. It, oh. The difference between the hinge and the flexion would be in the hinge, you're moving the weight with your glutes and your hamstrings and your torso's feet remaining locked into position. Whereas in the flexion, you're actually trying to move the weight with the muscles of your lower back. So you're allowing them to round and then straight back out. Now in that locked in position, moving the weight with your glutes and your hamstrings, you're gonna be able to pull off more weight than you can with the muscles of your lower back. So you need to adjust the loads. Like I wouldn't try to deadlift or like Jefferson deadlift 600 pounds, but that would be what I could deadlift with like the screen. Yeah, I think, I'm sorry. So weights and stuff like that. Is it better to kind of start slow and then work up? And then what is the like, what is a good way of knowing whether or not to move up? And There's a lot of different ways to attack progression, but when it comes to strengthening muscles and trying to build muscle, you do want to integrate in some type that's Load. What kind of progressive overload you attack will really work into like what your fitness goals are. For most people that just want to be kind of fit healthy, progression over the course of like several months is okay. Like let's say you're doing like a banded row and you start with 50 pounds and it feels pretty hard in the start. You do it again the next week with 50 pounds feels a little bit easier. By week four, it feels kind of really easy. So then week five, you go up to 60 pounds and maybe you maintain there for three to four weeks. That's a totally fine progression model. You don't have to go up every week. Somebody that's more of like an advanced lifter that wants to be a power lifter or bodybuilder or something like that, they might be attacking progression on more of a week to week basis with more frequency sets in than somebody that's just focused on being healthy and fit. So it's very goal.
we're going to show over time this week. And if we fail, we're going to Yeah. So it's stretching just is it better in the evening or morning? Or does it make a difference? I don't think it really makes a huge difference. The one time I would recommend avoiding stretching would be right before working out. I think it's shown that stretching, doing specific like static stretches where you hold it for a minute or longer before exercise can decrease the amount of power output your muscles have. Which, you know, if you're used to deadlifting 150 pounds and you do some stretches before your workout, and now theoretically you can only deadlift 130 pounds, trying to lift that 150 pounds would have a higher risk of hurting you. So I would avoid static stretches before your workout and keep it to just like dynamic stretches, things where you continue moving or just like something like walking on a treadmill or doing the movements you're going to do for the day first to help kind of increase your blood temperature. But stretching outside of that like hour before your workout period is basically any time that's fine. I personally recommend before bed and missing relaxation thing and can help people get better sleep. But morning, after workout, before bed, Basically, any time that isn't an hour. Oh, Ronan oh. asked a question. Ronan did ask a question. It's a question I can't up here. Is it okay to walk your daily amount after work rather than 250 steps every hour throughout the day? I think any type of movement is good movement. And if your only option is to do your steps after work and not get steps integrated in throughout the day, that's still going to be better than nothing. When I think it comes to reducing down back pain, I think that there's something to be said about breaking up the amount of time you're stuck in the same position all day. So doing that 250 steps throughout the day could be a little bit more beneficial for reducing that back pain than just hitting a total step goal. However, you know, sometimes you get busy with work and you're just like stuck in your computer. And if that's the position you've been in, it's better to hit those steps after work and do something to get some movement in, opposed to just being like, well, today's a write-off, so I'm going to go home and watch eight more hours. Thanks, guys.